Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Positive Vibes. This is a, a new segment created by my missus. It's called Fill Up Fridays. It's a bit, uh, you know, an up on pace, sort I of think. But uh, to kick us off, I've got a very special guest. Um, you'll definitely know him. He's played 578 games in League and Cup. He's managed eight different teams. He, well, he's a legend. And the legend I'm going to introduce is Mr. Sam Allardyce. Good morning, Sam. Good morning, Phil, on the Positive Vibes. Uh, nice to uh, communicate with you on Zoom for the first time for me. Uh, well, getting used to this technology is quite, uh, quite amazing in these difficult times. Well, it is. It's unprecedented difficult times. Uh, last night, just brought it out when I walked outside for the third week running to clap the NHS. Those people, I've got nothing but huge admiration for them. Yes, it's a, it's a massive uh, admiration for and all the care wake, uh, workers that are, are doing a fantastic job, all the delivery drivers, the supermarkets, what, whoever's out there supporting um, the NHS or doing what they can for the NHS and keeping us all watered and fed, it's a great respect to everybody. And uh, we just hope that somebody somewhere along the line, some scientist somewhere will break through uh, quicker than expected to try and get uh, the ultimate cure for this uh, this horrible virus. Yep, and it's nice that no longer will they be taken for granted. Absolutely true. And we just hope that the government, when this is all over, continue to support them a lot better than they've supported prior to this, this uh, pandemic and to make sure that they are fully supported from the government. So I think we'd all, we'd all pay that little bit more just to make sure that's going to be the case after this. Yeah, well said, well said. Right, so Sam, yeah. I've been doing a lot of research. I'm, I Have you? know you. Right. Go on. <laughs> You'll be telling me something I don't know or I've forgotten now, I hope. Well, I hope so, yeah. I'll yeah. cross out this transvestite bit. There we go. <laughs> so, born in Dudley. Yes, born in Dudley in the, in the West Midlands. Uh, came, here, came here up to Bolton in 69 when I was 15. And the uh, uh, first thing I did, Phil, was lose the accent. <laughs> so um, uh, I even in, interpret for Lynn when we watch Peaky Blinders because she can't quite understand the language. And uh, no, 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 if, no, no, no. If, if, if people out there don't know what I'm talking about, there's a few Midlanders watching, which I hope there are. But it goes back to when I drive through the Midlands and I'm going, I'm yeah, going on all right, love. Oh, yeah, going tonight, and or I've been here, yeah, all right. So that accent, because I got the Mickey taken out of me so much, sort of disappeared pretty quickly. But I am proud of coming from the from the black country, and a Wolverhampton fan, I believe, or as a kid. I was a Wolves fan. Yes, uh, my dad was a, poli a policeman. He used to uh, he used to do a bit of uh, a bit of work at, at Wolves on match days, and uh, was lucky enough to, in the first instance to get a few a couple of free tickets here and there. So we went along, me and my brother, and that's what got me hooked on uh, standing on the north bank and uh, watching Wolverhampton Wanderers way back in the day, which was uh, a long time ago now. Yeah, yeah. I think I went to the ground uh, with a guy called Tony Steenson when it first opened the new ground. But yeah. uh, what do you think of the new manager? He's doing a decent job, isn't he? Well, yeah, fantastic job. I mean, uh, I mean, the whole owners of the football club have reinvented uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers to for the better because of because of, uh, of their wealth and because of their knowledge of football. Not just the manager that they've chosen, but the infrastructure at Wolves has, has obviously proven to be the right way forward because they're recruitment system has given the manager quality players to work with and he gets the best out of them and uh, Wolves are, are on a, a big big high on a bigger high than they've ever been before and uh, it's uh, really good to uh, to see like you mean yeah absolutely well going back to yourself Sam. Lynn's, Lynn's, Lynn's playing something in the background and it's distracting me sorry I was, I was <laughs> she was listening to me. Back in, in, in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Phil. Go on. No, no. Listen, I, I was. How tall are you? Six foot three. Six foot three. Yes. Six Whoa. foot three. Well, this in, yeah. this interests me because my old man, who's sadly passed away, was six foot two and a half, six foot three himself, and he used to say there wasn't very many people at that time. And he's a, he's a lot older than you, but I want to go back to your playing days because six foot three. When you look at people like Billy Bremner, five foot five. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think even Dave Mackay wasn't as tall as anyone thought. He was about five foot nine, ten, I think. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So you you must have stood out being that size. 
Well, I stood out at school a bit too much, in, in all honesty. So, uh, from, a, from a very young age, I was head and shoulders above most, which uh, was a, a bit of a drawback, really, because I ended up starting to crouch over and uh, get a bit round-shouldered, like you mean, so because of, the, because of that situation. But you're right, that the, having, that, having that sort of height advantage in the end was a massive bonus in my time playing football, because... Uh, a part of my career was heading the ball about heading and tackling and um, and then obviously winning the ball back and playing out from the back it was uh, but that was a massive advantage for me because uh, more crosses coming into the box and balls kicked off the goalkeeper uh, one of my strengths became how good I was in the air and then obviously at the other end on set pieces renowned for one or two good goals in the past you know what I mean so uh, yeah it was a, it was a big part of me having a very very good career in, in the world of professional football and one I'm, I'm hugely, hugely grateful for. So uh, often say that um, when I'm out and about lecturing today that uh, I haven't really worked because leaving home at 15 and becoming a professional footballer at 18, the professional contract and staying in the game now till 65, uh, is this, this is the longest period I've had out of the game in, in terms of working in it. And uh, I've been privileged to to go as far and to go as long as I've gone, and uh, to, then to escalate into management to coaches has been just a just a fabulous dream for me. Well, yeah, I mean, it's something you should be very proud of, especially when you look back. Because what I what I was thinking before, one of the guy the, the guys I admire at the moment is Van Dyke. He's sort of a Rolls Royce of a footballer, and I was just thinking, how do you think Van Dyke would have uh, fared on at Turf Moor on a, a February <laughs> the sixth, covered in snow and ice and everything else? With a ball that was weighed down by the rain. Weighed down. Well, I think that we talk about that quite a bit when we do meet up, and and it's about the uh, uh, about the state of the pitches as well, like you mean. But I do think footballers of his his intense quality and his high level of quality would cope with anything today or then. I yeah. just think he'd be a good footballer no matter what. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, when we when we see the likes of what we've experienced it over our lifetime, and uh, and you know, when you're playing against the I played against the George Besties on pitches like that. And it was never a problem for him. So for Virgil van Dijk, who's one of the best players coming out from the back, I wouldn't have thought it would be a problem for him. No, because I just looked at a picture today of Ralph Coke sat by a goalpost. You could just about make him out. He's covered in mud. It looks like he's come out yeah. with his thumb. <laughs> well, we used, to, we used to have so many changes of studs, studs depending on the weather they, them days. Uh, it, it, was, it was unbelievable. And... And we wouldn't be playing um, under those conditions today. The, the, the games would actually be called off, like you mean. So, uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, I have to say, great times, great times. Who's the hardest forward you came up against, would you say? Hardest in terms of ability or hardest in terms of physical? Uh, well, let's take, let's take both. Both, right, OK. Uh, in terms of ability, um, it was your dog leashes. Uh, you can dog leashes. Um, I think that uh, he was uh, so, so clever, so skillful. Uh, I think in your speed, it was an Ian Rush. Um, if you got half a yard, there was no chance of you ever catching him. And in terms of physical challenges, which is more about what I liked, uh, would have been a Joe Royal or a Joe Jordan. And the, the, I like the I like the sort of most the smaller players. Were a bit more difficult for me, uh, but the bigger ones were, were as, as good a challenge as you'd like. You've named two tough ones there, especially with Joe yeah. Jordan coming out with no teeth. Yeah, that that's right. Cool. I mean, no teeth in his 20s, what's that like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You've got it all there, haven't you? They'll be all, they'll be all white now. <laughs> we're down here <laughs> well, I, rem I remember talking to uh, Bestie uh, uh, I've met him quite a few times towards the latter thing but when he talked about football he said the hardest uh, defender he ever came up was uh, Dave Mackay yes. well that's why I got onto that height thing because Dave Mackay I think was about 5'9", five, 5'10 five, but that's looked, right. looked, looked your height when he stood up he did he did he was, he was a he was a terrific, uh, he was a, not just a, a very hard defender, but he was, a, he was a terrific player as well. I mean, I think when you, when you talk about defending, when we don't talk about it, we talk about it less now than we did before. The qualities of defending is how good you sense danger and how good you are at getting in positions to nullify generally what players are more talented than you are. 
you're in there, your job in defending terms are your skill as a defender. The, the, pl the players you're playing against have probably a better touch, maybe a little quicker than you. But what you have to do is you have to think a little bit quicker than they do to overcome their extra abilities they might have when you're playing against them. And of course, that's a, a big challenge today for defenders because there is becoming little or no contact in the sport today. Yeah. You know, just a just a, a tackle which was normal for us is generally a foul or or even a booking today. Yeah, yeah. That, that made me laugh because I was reading something about the Bolton fans calling you Super Sam Bionic Man. Yeah. <laughs> After the challenges, you'd always get up and just leave them on the floor. That's. Uh... <laughs> well, I was, well, I was very I was very proud of that. That that tag. Um, yeah. I think that uh, when you're when you're a centre half and your team, your fans, take to you and start singing songs in your name, yeah. you expect that to be the, the forwards and, and the the more skillful players. You know what I mean? You don't expect it to be the, you know, as many said, the ugly centre half that, that that tries to tries to stop the opposition. You know. So I was very very privileged and very proud that the Wanderers fans took to me in in, in that form. Yeah, could have gone the other way. Could I remember Billy Ayer when I used to watch Hartlepool? I'm from up that way. And Billy Ayer was the same. That every they'd start every game by singing his name. Yes, yeah. So it is. I mean, that's what you you wake up on the, on the weekend for. You wake up in the morning and you're a little bit nervous. You, you you start sweating under the armpits a little bit. You look forward to get to get in the dressing room a little bit more work. Then you get out on the pitch and then the crowd as you walk through the tunnel. You know the airs. The airs have never stopped standing up on the back of your neck and on your arm, and thinking how privileged you are to be, to be entertaining all this public and playing, playing professional football. Sometimes you can, you can get so close to it you forget how lucky and how privileged you are. But when you, when you go through your career and you maybe pick up an injury or you, uh, you get left out of the team a while for whatever reason, then you really appreciate it even more. Then. Yeah, well, I mean, going back to you, your first pay packet, according to what I was reading, was £14, and you supplemented that by working in a, a, a factory that made record decks and selling aspirins and yes. whatever. So it's the right. love of the game, and that comes through, Sam. Well, yeah, that, you know, I think that uh, I, I even had a spell on the parks where I was um, I was cutting grass. So uh, uh, the, the only good thing out the parks was the, the, the lad who, who was our boss, it used to give us a few extra bedding plants to bring home and plant in the <laughs> garden. So, so I had probably one, I had probably one of the best gardens on a, on a <laughs> around the, around the area, like you mean. So it was a that was like an added bonus, like then. And I think that uh, I think the one the one thing that did as well it helped me keep fit because I was walking yeah, for yeah. miles and miles, you know. Um, and like I say, uh, you know. You took you took a bit more pride when I did that job. I took a bit more pride in my own garden, like you mean. So Sundays, unlike probably most footballers now, and certainly me now, Sundays was always about getting up, doing the garden, washing the cars, you know, and getting ready for the week to start again on Monday. I'm sure you were the same. Yeah, well, yeah, I worked as a security guard and all sorts of things, but I just can't get it out of my my head where other players come back with the keys to a Ferrari or whatever nowadays for doing nothing. You used to come back in your overalls with a hydrangea. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's six foot three. Oh, oh, I can see pictures. Perfect. Anyway, Sam, listen, I could go on forever. So I, I want to get to, I want to skip through the, the playing career because I know Sunderland, Huddersfield, Notts County goes on. One thing that I did want to pick up on, which made me laugh again, was the fact that uh, you were offered the managerial position at uh, Millwall, turned it down, and you give a chance to a young George Graham. That's very true. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you consider that I had a, a, a very, a very good relationship with the owner of Millwall, uh, his name was Alan Thorne, who was a, he was a very rich man, very, very rich man. He used to wear the trilby and yeah, the, right. the and the Crombie overcoat. You know what I mean? He was he's there. Used to be brilled back with with brill cream. He told, "Oh, Sam, how are you doing, Sam? Anything I can do for you? Yeah, how's the team going? Yeah, wow, well, well, you know all that." He was really, he really did help me and Lynn and look after, look after us at that particular time. Because moving to London and picking the family up and there was a big, big move for us. Yeah. And he did a fabulous job for me and for me and Lynn moving that time. So when Peter Anderson, the previous manager, got sacked, he came to me and said, "Will you take the player manager's job?" And I said, "I'm, I'm 27 years old." That I said, I can, that's really, really, you know, I really appreciate, you know, the fact that you've, you've offered me the job. But 
it's just too early for me and, and I haven't done any studying in coaching or whatever that might be. So, uh, yeah, that then left the opening for George Graham and, uh, and George looked, went on to, on, to, uh, on to greater things, like you mean. So, mm -hmm. as his first job, he did a great job for Millwall, got them out that division and, and got promoted and then, then went back to uh, his, his, probably his most favourite club, which was Arsenal. Yeah, and then finished all too soon. You know that was... Yeah, that's very true. Very true. Yeah. So yourself, what the, uh, you know, a lot of people have tagged you with various things, as we all get. Mm, yeah, some yeah. good, some bad. But when you went out to uh, Tampa Bay, so you go to Tampa yeah. Bay, you play, you had eleven appearances. A lot of a lot of players went out there. Bestie, Rodney, all that. They all went out there. But you didn't concentrate so much on the football. I don't mean that in a derogatory way. But well, what you did was pick up from the Buccaneers that shared the stadium, perhaps, and you picked up on the sports science. That's what I was quite interested in. So really, what you did out there was bring back something. And I bet people looked at you and said crank and all sorts of things for doing this. Sort of. mm. I remember at the time, statistics, nutritionists, sports yeah. science, yeah. You know, metrics. It's, I mean, you took that and you brought that in. So really, in my eyes, a lot of people's eyes, uh, that you were the founder, not the founder, but you're certainly uh, one of the first people to bring that up to this country. Uh, I, yeah, I think that um, the, the beauty of Tampa Bay Rowdies was obviously it was just such a wonderful place to live and work in. Um, I'd have loved to have stayed, but unfortunately, the franchises up in, in the soccer leagues folded then, so I had to come back to Coventry. But I spent my time up at Tampa Bay Bucks. Uh, training ground because they were uh, they were coming in for pre-season and uh, the, the lads who lived in in the, the same apartments as me and Lynn lived in so Lynn got friendly with the wives and I got friendly with the players so I used to spend all the, a, a good bit of this time because in the heat and the humidity at Tampa Bay and we were playing through the summer we could barely train for more than an hour an hour and 15 minutes because you know you were just Dehydrated, you were you were just shattered with the with the with the heat and the sweat that you 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 taken out of your body. So uh, we used to be told told about refueling that, and then I used to go up, and the lads used to say, one thing the Americans are very good at is sharing. You know, they share things with you. They are open and share. So they say, come and look what we do. Like you mean, you do soccer. Come and have a look what we do. And I'm and I mean, it just blew my mind. I mean, it was just it, it, you know the level of detail, the level of people that worked in certain areas and in specific areas. And that really, really changed my, changed my life because they talked about nutrition and diet and stuff like that. Um, they talked about psychology, psychiatry, talked about nutrition, talked about stats, talked about playmaking, talked about the quarterback, how he has to learn the playbook. And, and I thought that this is... Um, uh, strength and conditioning coaches about about the big guys actually got actually used to get told off if they lost weight. They had to put a certain amount of weight on. They had to weigh this level and be at this level to play in that position. You know, uh, the faster players out in the wide positions. You know, just understanding and learning what they got to do and and the individuals that they could go to were just like I said. Just my. I mean, they even had like four lads who just strapped people. Just, just there to strap. I mean, they could do strappings like you'd never believe. Yeah, yeah. you know that. You know where. And back in England, at the first, and this is in the first division, because I went back to play for Coventry in the first division. We'd had the manager, the assistant manager, the first team coach, a physio, finished. That was it. Scouts, match reports on the opposition, but not none of the no detail that. And I always thought that if I ever stay in football, which would which would be something that I was starting to think about because I was 27, 28 then, then I will do my coaching badges. And then if I'm lucky enough one day to be a manager, I would implement or try and implement some of that, some of those ideas. And that really came about. The only time I could, I'd been a manager at Blackpool and places like that, Notch County. The only place I could implement that was when I went back to the Wanderers and said, I want to transform this football club uh, from what it used to be. Um, to em, uh, emulate the new stadium, it had a brand, brand new stadium, yeah, but it, it had a it had a rusty old boot in the cupboard. They were still working on the old fashioned old days, you know, yeah, you know yeah, tea, yeah. tea, coffee, you know, egg and chips, pie and chips <laughs> after a game. I mean, so we we Good transformed. <laughs> we we tra well, I had to convince the board to to um, 
to give me this staff and um, and, and and that was a difficult job and that's where you start be be relating to coaches coaching and management is so different because your your job to to convince the board and relate to the board what you need and to actually be able to persuade them to get it was the reason why Boltman has became successful because the board allowed me to get on with it and me to build what I built and make one thing for sure if it hadn't worked that would have been cut relatively quickly because of the expense but hopefully it uh, paid off and uh, the older football has benefited from the world of knowledge now and uh, the science and, and fo in football and uh, the technology, the algorithms, the stats are so high in every football club that uh, that they're a great they're a great asset to have at your fingertips now. Yeah, well, it's a business after all, isn't it? And that's what we've it seen. Is. And that's what we've seen. So you implemented those things, and this is what I used to watch: the Bolton team that you created. Now look down here. Some of the players that you got in: Hero, Campo, Gudjonsson. The list goes on. Jokaev. I mean, I was just looking at. I mean, didn't I think? Piero, he was like three-time European champion, wasn't he? And yeah. How did you get them to Bolton? Uh, well, I think that the biggest, the biggest, uh, the biggest thing that changed the Wanderers uh, in, into um, an exciting football club was was pulling pulling off the first player of that capacity and that level and that quality, and that was Yuri Yorkayev. Yeah, yeah. And Yuri was the man that came in year one in the Premier League in in January and uh, Yuri needed to, uh, I've said this story many times, Yuri needed to play football to get in the French national squad for the World Cup that season and he said I'll come and play for you, I'll come and help you stay in the Premier League, you'll help me to get in the French national side and Yuri's obviously World Cup winner, European yeah, yeah. Championship winner, European Cup winner. So this was a, like a, a, an eye-opener for everybody um, not not just at Bolton Wanderers, but in the Premier League, and this short term uh, worked exceptionally well. We we were safe in the league with about four games to go. Uh, Yuri went off to the World Cup and um, and uh, and rang us up rang us up in about I think it was the beginning or the middle of July when we started pre season and said, "Can we can I come back?" And uh, he came back for a three year contract, and I think that. That just said it all for us. What we, we felt, or my staff felt like we were doing the right thing more then than we, we did before. Because if you've got somebody of that capability and that quality to want to come back and play for you for three years, it set the ball rolling. So our targets became, if you've got a player of that quality and he wants to come and play in the Premier League, we would be interested. And we made a, a big run on the fact that not only were they great quality players, but they were that they were wanting to play in the Premier League, and they and they were affordable for our wage structure at that particular time, uh, because uh, obviously we were paying in the Premier League even then way ahead of a lot of European clubs. So if you weren't playing for Real Madrid anymore or Barcelona or Bayern Munich or Juventus, our wages were better. In, in the Premier League than they were in, in the rest of Europe. So there then came uh, Bruno Ngotti, JJ Akocha, oh. Yuri, Campo, Nicholas oh, Anelka, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, so yeah. it became it, it became like an attract we became like an attraction where, you know, the, 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 we'd speak to those players, those players would pick the phone up to Yuri or to JJ and say, What's it like? And uh, they used to come and join us. The bad, th the sad, the sad thing about that was uh, we got tagged with this long ball tag stuff, and uh, you know to see to see that team on paper and say that we're I mean, how I, uh, well in the beginning, you know, year one and two we had to be we had to be direct Phil. we had to you know we had to do the right things to stay in the league, but by year four or five going into Europe we were completely different. But wouldn't you know as well as me when you get the tag, the tag stays with you. Yeah, it does, and I, mean, I just can't believe it. It seems a ridiculous tag now, especially when the, the players that I've mentioned and you've mentioned, I mean, I can't even think of one of those that played long ball. So they were all skillful, a cotcher. I mean, they were, yeah. that drew the crowds in. I used to watch it week in, week out. Well, the crowd nicknamed JJ, he's so good they named him twice. <laughs> and, the, and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the commercial side were pretty good because they printed a T-shirt on it and they sold thousands of those. 
So, uh, I mean, that sort of stuff. I mean, Campo Wiggs, if you remember yeah, Ivan yeah, Campo, yeah. like, I mean, yeah, with that, you, know, he, yeah. you know, he won the European Cup with Real Madrid and he had the great big, you know, the great yeah. big afro, like, curly mop. I mean, we brought those out, yeah. so there are a lot of fans going around with, a, you know, a Campo shirt on, with a wig on and JJ t shirts. And I mean, and that was, that's, for me as a manager, that's like, you know, that's like, um, the ultimate for you it's the ultimate work experience that you are but isn't really work you're just uh, you're just allowing the players to express themselves yeah. everybody knew what they had to do yeah because we'd all worked together for a long time and my job was to really to try and keep it going by making some hard choices and making replacements at the right time to keep that flow going if you like you know to to not let it waver and not let it dip and so the job became so much easier in three, four, and five. We ended up into Europe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, one of the things again that I picked up on was that the uh, players giving you a forfeit that made me laugh. So every time they scored more than three, three one by three goals, they yeah. give you a forfeit. And you beat Leicester. <laughs> five one. Five one. <laughs> yeah. What did they make you do? Oh, eat testicles. <laughs> uh, eat, eat. Uh, Eat eyeballs, sheep's eyeballs, and eat uh, eat eat the hottest curry of all. I think it was vile, vile curry. And we had this in uh, he actually. Uh, he's, he's passed away now. God rest his soul. We actually dragged the chairman out with us at that time, um, Phil Gartside, oh, yeah. and made and made him do the same like him in. So, oh, really? so yeah, it was it, that was a Dean Allsworth yeah, Wimbledon. Dean Allsworth, yeah. That was that was Dean Allsworth's Wimbledon sort of. So sort of, this is what we used to do at Wimbledon to bond. This is what we did, you know, to be all to get that all. So we thought we'll have a go at that. And little did we know that we were going to end up on the first game of the season. And I tell you what, we were we were very glad to do it because winning your first game in the Premier League uh, or back in the Premier League five at Leicester was yeah. uh, was a great thing. It was a great day. Yeah, and that's what, like you said, that's what makes the job easy. It's, e it's easy for you just to keep it ticking over. Don't get me wrong; it's still hard. But when they're all, everyone I've come across and read about have always said the same thing about you, that your man management was one of your main attributes. And the fact that you could put the, to use a cliche, the arm around the shoulder or the kick up the arse, it was one of the two. And you did it better than anyone. I think um, it became a part of what are, you, what are you, you have to understand that and that many people taught you in, in, in terms of what you want. But I had a, uh, a young guy that came from university called Mike Ford, who was um, uh, came as a, a sports psychologist who we took on as performance director. And uh, I, I actually spent a lot of time with him saying, how do I understand myself more? How do I understand myself better? And it was the, the times we talked about, you know, eventually I was always a bit worried about my weaknesses and a bit worried about, you know, how do how do I cover them like I mean and, and with his help it's about forget about your weaknesses and let's look at your strengths and let's build your strengths like I mean so uh, what what were my strengths is something I started to to promote and stick to more and section off with with this great staff that we built well I'm weak at that so I'm not going to enter into that I'm going to find somebody who is strong in that department who is strong at that that particular uh, thing that we need in football so so that became or well, give me the capacity and the time to become even better in man management terms if you like to understand people more we used to do player profiles and staff profiles which told you about what the person is uh, uh, when he's private when he's at home and what the person's like when he's in public there are, there are two different Phil Middlemasses there's the one who's here on the screen now and there's the one who's at home doing whatever he's doing, whether you think about it or not, but there yeah. are. So understanding what they're... What, and we, we went through these profiles and they could only get done in America at that time. So uh, he used to say, look, well, if you're, going to, if you're going to dish out one of your roastings, you're going to really affect him in the wrong way. But if you do this like that, you're going to do... It. So I learned from that and then underst understood the, um, the person himself because in the football world, we used to used to get told so many times we've all get treated the same, and that's an absolute nonsense because yeah. we're all different human beings and react in different ways. So, so to test this profile, this is quite this is quite good. I didn't I made reservations about this profile, so I brought I brought this profile on to Lynn and said to Lynn, um, 
uh, tell me what player that is at Bolton Wanderers. And she read it and went, that's you. <laughs> so you are. She went, that's you, that is. I said, oh, it's not. It's a place. She went, no, it's you. So it gave me great confidence because she got it spot on, like you mean. So, so well, if you can't get down. it spot on, no one can. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I mean, I, I don't know. I've got to speak to my technical advisor who's down here. Oh, right, okay. I, I could go on talking. <laughs> okay, can we not make it longer? All right, five more minutes. You've got five minutes, right. Sam. Five minutes, no problem. Brilliant. That's brilliant. Well, we've gone past, we've gone past that now. So I'm going to do my, a bit I've got written down here, which is just, uh, so this is you, this is hypothetical. And I've, hypothetical. Seen you, I've seen you dress up as many people and I've seen you and Barry <laughs> perform in many different situations. <laughs> Luckily, I'm usually drunk. I've never come <laughs> on to you. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> right. So you're in your lockdown, your little man cave. Lynn's not, there's no one there, just you. What's the meal? One meal, favourite food you could take in? My, my favourite food to take, take in, I think, would be a uh, fillet steak. Uh, sorry about that to any vegans out there. Uh, fillet steak, cauliflower cheese, runner, runner beans, and um, a jacket potato. It's not a bad choice. I've just got, down there, I've just got, mmm. And I might, just, I might just put a bit of uh, peppercorn sauce on that. Or oh, peppercorn sauce, well, yeah. perfect. How do you have your steak done? Medium well. Medium well, I'm the other way yeah. around. Medium well, around. I know, well, yeah, but when you had a mother that cooked everything till it were <laughs> dark brown, you know, getting to medium well is pretty good, like, really. Yeah, yeah, well, mine, yeah, well, it's good. Okay. And what uh, beverage would you have with that? Well, it would be, uh, with that particularly, it would be a glass of uh, Pomerol. Pomerol, um, okay. Yeah, Pomerol. I'm a Bordeaux man, like the French yeah. Bordeaux. Oh, right. So you're a red rather than white, or do you like both? Oh, no, the whites, casually. If we're just yeah. if we're just drinking sort of casually, a uh, glass of um, Cloudy Bay, uh, which yeah. is uh, obviously uh, me and Lynn's favourite. So uh, yeah, that's nice, very nice. But, uh, little we, stop, we have to stop ourselves good. drinking too much at home with the boredom. So I know, we've got yeah. to lock it away. <laughs> this is what I read. Someone said that fitness has gone down by sixty percent and alcohol's gone up by sixty <laughs> percent. People have given up on that. Not me. Right. So okay. So this is I'm going to make a film and I'm going to make a film and I'm going to call it Big Sam. Right? Yeah. Hypothetical, Sam, don't panic. Okay. So, who do we get to play Big Sam? Well, I'm not so sure. People will have to Google this, like you mean, but this goes way back into my time. But I'd be Bert Lancaster. But, oh, Bert Lancaster. Uh, that would Lancaster. be me. It would be me. But then, then, so, there'd be a lot of people out there saying Bert who. But have a look <laughs> at him. I, I, yeah, I've I been can. watching on, see, I've been watching the telly recently, and there's a lot of that stuff coming on about the old. Film yeah. moguls, you know what I mean? And he was just on the other day, so you know, when you're just saying that, it just popped into my mind thinking, Yeah, I mean, I might have gone for a, a Robert De Niro, but he, he's a bit short, like, isn't he? Where Bert, I think, was a bit, well, bit Bert tall, was a like bit, yeah, it. yeah. Well, from here to eternity, that means you've got to roll around in the sand with Lynn. So, any <laughs> you all right, Lynn? <laughs> she, she'll be laughing upstairs now because she's gone upstairs <laughs> listening to it. So, who's gonna, who's gonna play Lynn? Be very oh, careful, no doubt about this, Julia Roberts. Oh, you smooth talker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got Bert Lancaster, Julia Roberts. He's a good one for you. You're a good mate and someone I know quite well. Who's going to play Reedy, Peter Reed? Danny DeVito. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Reedy. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, well, what about Brucey, Steve Bruce? Steve Bruce. That's a, tough one. That's a tough one, that. <laughs> uh, Robert Redford. He'll be delighted. He'll be so delighted. Robert Redford. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, listening, I'm going to bring this to a close. Uh, I, want, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You've been brilliant as always. Uh, no problem. Thanks to, thanks to Lynn. Thanks to my Leanne who set this up. Uh, do me a favour and just stay safe and get back on the golf course and I'll see you when this is all over. Thanks again. Uh, stay, stay safe, everybody. And uh, make sure you stay in this weekend. Don't be venturing out as much as you might want to. And... Uh, if you want to do it again in a month, Phil, uh, not a problem. Thank you very much, Sam. Appreciate it. No problem. It. Okay. Well, my Cheers, friend. Bye. Bye.